That's all right. I'll stand over here. No, it's okay. Uh, Welcome to Oak Hills Community Church, y'all. It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, Do have a few announcements. First of all, uh, we have a wedding reception for Beth Ann Emery. Oh, please be seated. Sorry. Yes, please sit down. (laughs) Beth Ann Emery and Kevin Hammond, Sunday, August the 7th from 2 to 4 p.m., And the Emory's are asking if you would sign up, uh, let folks know that you're coming. There's the little uh, wooden pedestal out front. Uh, If you you plan on making it to the wedding reception, or if you think you might be going to the wedding reception, please put your name down with the number of people you're bringing. Also, we have our... We have to get used to calling her Beth Ann Hammond. Okay, Beth Ann Hammond. They are married. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad I went through. <laughs> then we need to get this changed because it says Beth Ann Emery. Yeah, she's not. Okay. Well, you better get on that. <laughs> we have our next sweet house of prayer, which is our communal prayer time, Saturday, August 6, 10 to 11, right up front. Uh, please come and we just have coffee, fellowship for a little bit, and then we pray about our nation, our church, our community. Um, and our families, and it is a sweet, sweet time of just communal praying, praying together. Volunteer ministry, just want to uh, let you know that the kids' ministry, children's ministry, they're out there playing right now. They do need extra volunteers to kind of rotate, oh, about once every six or seven Sundays to help out, um, and you can see we've got quite a few of them out there today, so we need uh, some volunteers' help to keep an eye on the kiddos, if you can. Please go see Kara Gabbard. Also, we have a deacon's fund that we use uh, here at the church to help out folks who are in need. If you're uh, people that, you know, get into a tough scrape and they need a little extra money or a little extra help, uh, you can donate to the deacon's fund by just writing your normal check to the church uh, and on the, uh, don't put anything on the memo line, but put a sticky note or a little note clipped to it that says Deacon's Fund. And then uh, Joyce will know to put that in that, that Deacon's Fund. But don't put it on the memo line because that messes up accounting with the banks and stuff. Finally, you may have noticed or you may not have, we have a greeting card ministry We started this during COVID when the church was shut down. Well, everything was shut down and we couldn't meet. And so we started to send out greeting cards to everybody, all of the church members and visitors, everybody that gave us an address, we would send out cards. Well, we've continued that uh, and we would like to continue it. And if you are not getting a greeting card every couple of months and you would like to get one, we have these yellow sheets right out front. And if you'll just put your name and your address you'll be on the list to start getting a greeting card. You do not have to be a member of Oak Hills Church, but if you just need some encouragement on a regular basis, like I said, every couple of months, go ahead and put your name and address down on these yellow sheets out there. They're on a clipboard. And if you want a birthday card, just put your birth month. You don't have to put a year, anything like that to date yourself, but just your birth month, and you'll get a birthday card too. And it's just another way that we we tell you that we love you. Everybody is welcome in this church. We are so blessed by your presence here. And now let's continue our worship. Thank you. All right. If you guys would like to go ahead and uh, stand back up. Um, Michaela is actually going to lead us on our next song, Mighty to Save. Such a... um such a sweet song, such a, a good reminder that we all, we all are in need of grace, right? We are all in need of compassion and kindness. So let's stand and sing this together.
build my life. We are to build our life upon the rock. We are to build our life upon Christ. He is who our eyes are fixed upon, and he is worthy of every song that we sing and every breath that we breathe. So let's sing that out to him this morning.
song this morning before we go into the message. It may be familiar to you. It may be a new one. Um, but it'd be my honor just to lead us through. It's called Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me. And, you know, in the book of Galatians chapter 2, it says that it is not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, right? Every day um, I wake up with every breath that I have, I am to praise his name, to sacrifice, lay down my life, and live for Christ. Everything I do is through him. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I can always tell when I'm striving on my own strength, it's just, it's not going to go the way it should. And, and I'm thankful for that resistance. I'm thankful that the Lord is so patient and sweet to draw me back in. Uh, and so um, as we go through this next song, please feel free, if it's familiar to you, sing along. If you want to spend this time just preparing your heart to receive the word, um, or just some time in prayer, uh, feel free to do that as well. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is
She's just going to lead us in a prayer over our body now. So let's, let's all bow our heads as, um, as Michelle comes up and leads us in a prayer. Good morning. This is the time in our service when we share our prayer requests. And we'd just like to start by saying, Joe, it's wonderful to see you back with us out of the hospital this week. That is a praise, praise to the Lord. And also uh, some news. We've been praying uh, for Zach, Kelly, Jordan, Ezekiel, and Ryan, and they will be visiting us next week. So we're very excited to get to meet them in person. Um, Kelly has shared, uh, you know, Ryan has a significant health needs. And so uh, when you see her, you may have some questions. And Kelly said, please ask. Please feel free to um, engage and ask questions. It's an opportunity for her to educate and share with you about Ryan's condition. So, so don't be bashful about that. Please join me in prayer. Father God, your name is great. Just as you are great, the all-powerful, everlasting, eternal Lord God Almighty. We thank you for allowing us to call on you in any circumstance and for promising to be our all in all at all times. Father, thank you that we can bring our prayers to your throne. We lift up Susie, who's heal asking for healing in her back and her left leg. Please bring relief to Susie, help her to heal completely, and help her to rest in you through the process. Father, we lift up Joe, and we thank you that he is here with us today. We pray for full recovery from his recent illness, and that if there's anything he can do to prevent um, this type of sickness again or any answers that he needs to have, Father, please provide those. We lift up Grayson. This little boy is adjusting to summer and family activities, and Father, we praise you that he is doing so well with his leukemia treatments. Father, we lift up his family and ask that you would bring energy and stamina to his mom and to his grandmother as they also are caring for a great-grandmother in this family. 
Father, we lift up Kelly. We pray for relief from shoulder pain, that she would regain her mobility in her shoulder. We lift up Kathy. We ask for answers from specialists and possible new diagnoses and treatment for her breathing issues. Please comfort Kathy as she continues to talk with specialists and seek treatment. Father, we thank you that Duke is doing so well with his cancer treatments, and we pray for continued encouragement and peace for Duke and Mary as they continue this journey towards full recovery. And Father, we lift up Mary. She has continued good pro progress with her rehab and healing from back surgery. It is all a praise to you, Lord. And Father, we lift up Dr. Carol, and we thank you that she was able to return to part-time service this week and meeting her patients. We pray for complete healing of her back, that she would have new strength every day. And Father, we lift up Diane and John's friend, Richard. We praise you that his surgery went well to amputate both legs below the knee. And Father, we just ask for your continued healing to give Richard strength and encouragement through this time as he adjusts, um, obviously, to this very radical surgery. Father, we remember Max, a young man who is struggling with mental health issues. We ask for your comfort and peace in Max's heart. And if he does not know you, we pray that he will turn to you and seek Jesus as his savior. Father, we lift up Sarah Blanchard's grandson, John, he has suffered burns over 27% of his body and is in trauma care. Please fully heal John. Please bring him relief from pain and comfort the family in this time. Father, we remember Zach, Kelly, Jordan, Ezekiel, and Ryan, and we ask for your provision in connecting them with doctors and getting them the equipment that they need for Ryan's care. We praise you that it sounds like you've brought a teaching job for Zach and you continue to provide in amazing ways for this family. Father, we lift up Esther. We pray that she would continue to be a comfort to her cousin who has been dealing with the aftermath of her husband's sudden death. We pray that Esther would just be able to help and assist in any way that through Esther, this family would feel your peace and love, Father. And please bring safe travels for Esther as she heads home at the end of this month. We lift up Gary, Kelly, and Maria. Uh, they are on a family vacation that is very different than what they had planned because they are without their grandchildren. Father, we just pray that this time would be refreshing to them, that they would enjoy being with other family, that they would have a calmness in their hearts, and that they would be able to come to some restoration of cooperation with the kids' visitation and their care going forward. Father, we lift up Mike and Nancy. We have prayers for this family because Mike's brother Zane passed away suddenly last week. And we do pray for peace and comfort for Susan, his wife. Father, we lift up Savannah's friend, Patience. We ask for your provision with financial struggles and helping patients to find employment with insurance benefits. And Father, we lift up our missionaries, especially those in Moldova, Several have been with us over the past week. We pray for their safe travels home and that you would provide in all ways for them to continue the mission that you've put in their hearts. We thank you for their willing hearts, and we thank you that, that they continue this good work. Father, please be with our Oak Hills Ministries and EFCA churches. Help us to be continuously spirit-led, making disciples, and continuing the good work that you planned for us in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. I almost said thank you, darling, and then Somebody out there may not realize that we were married and <clears throat> accuse me of being a redneck or something. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we hope you are feeling welcomed and blessed. Uh, Oak Hills Church is blessed by your presence here today. We are very grateful. <clears throat> today we're concluding our study of the book of Ruth, looking at chapters 3 and 4. What does acting in love look like? 
Last week, we saw that sacrificial love means loving the unlovable and being willing to act in faith. Today, we will see that acting in and for love means having integrity and courage because doing the right thing can be unpopular, misunderstood, and even risky. Boaz will show us that when we are willing to risk everything by trusting in God, we have nothing to fear. His choice to help Ruth and Naomi was not as simple as it first appears. So follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. Starting in chapter 3, we see that the women seek the favor and protection of a kinsman redeemer. In the first three verses, Naomi's plan for Ruth means risking everything. Naomi loves Ruth and wants her to have a family. If she was married, Ruth would belong to a family and would not have to glean grain as a pauper. Boaz is the answer to Naomi's prayer for Ruth. He will be at the threshing floor that night, a place used to separate grain. He will stay the night to celebrate the harvest and to guard his grain against thieves. Remember, this is all occurring during the lawless time of the judges. Now, though Boaz is a blood relative of Naomi's husband, who's deceased, he remains a close relative of Naomi by law. Naomi encourages Ruth to look her best. Even in poverty, uh, the women have something better than their daily work clothes. Now, possibly that they had an outer garment that was not worn all the time, uh, maybe used for warmth, or uh, poor people usually did have funeral clothes, which were nicer than their, their daily wear. Also, bathing and perfume were not regular habits of poor widows at the time. The perfume may have been their last luxury. Or perhaps they had sold some of the extra grain Boaz had given them to buy it. The point is that they are doing their very best to appeal to Boaz as a man. So Ruth is to visit Boaz after their feasting. The feast or celebration honored God who had provided the harvested crops. Boaz will probably be in a better mood after some food in his belly and drinking some wine or beer down his gullet. In verses 4 and 5, we see that Ruth takes an enormous risk. The plan shows how much faith they had that God had led them to Boaz. Touching and holding his feet was an act of humble submission, but it is also a daring and dramatic action. It symbolizes Ruth's request for Boaz's protection through marriage. So Boaz would have to choose to protect Ruth by marrying her or not. But the risk they run has to do with Boaz's integrity. What if he was a phony, acting one way publicly in the daytime and acting differently in the dark, alone with Ruth? Would he agree to marry her, or would he just use her as a mistress? If he took advantage of her by force, who would believe a Moabite pauper? over a well-respected rich man. If it came to a trial, wouldn't it be plausible that she threw herself at Boaz? See, the only thing Ruth has going for her is her reputation. And Naomi's plan is an enormous indication of her faith in God and in Boaz. Ruth and Naomi both trust that God had led them to Boaz for a good reason, and they trust that Boaz is a man of honor who can be trusted to preserve their dignity as well as their survival. Ruth will obey Naomi's instructions, showing her trust in Naomi with everything she has. In verses 6 through 8, Ruth goes to Boaz. 
She honors her word and does what Naomi had told her to do. She secretly approaches Boaz at night because there is a risk if she is seen. People are people and will jump to conclusions, usually the wrong ones. Was she anxious? I think she was calm, secure in the knowledge that the Lord was in control. The darkness, however, would conceal her humiliation if Boaz refused her request or if he acted badly. The honor and integrity of both Ruth and Boaz as an honorable man of the Lord would not be criticized or gossiped about if nobody knew of their meeting. But God, Naomi and Ruth realized that God is in control, that he brought them safely to Bethlehem from Moab, and they trust his choice of Boaz as their redeemer, who is not a typical male who neither knows nor fears the Lord. And Boaz wakes to find a woman at his feet. Quite a surprise for any man, wouldn't you say? In verse 9, Ruth appeals to Boaz. She deliberately uses the same word Boaz used in reference to God in chapter 2, verse 12, which we saw last week. When Boaz said, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. So Ruth is clearly asking for Boaz's protection as a kinsman redeemer. It was customary in ancient Israel for a kinsman redeemer to accept such a request, but it could be refused. The Hebrew word is geel, and it refers to a relative who acted as a protector or guarantor of the family rights. He could be called upon to perform a number of duties, such as buying back property that the family had sold, providing an heir for a deceased brother by marrying that brother's wife and producing a child with her, buying back a family member who had been sold into slavery due to poverty, and avenging a relative who had been murdered by killing the murderer. You are a close relative indicates that she was seeking his refuge in the sense of requesting him as her husband. It is a gamble for Boaz too. If they have only one child or no children, Boaz's family line would die out. Remember, Ruth was married without offspring for several years before this. Then in verses 10 and 11, Boaz understands the risks and accepts the responsibility. He praises Ruth for not seeking a younger man, so Boaz is somewhat older than Ruth. He recognizes Ruth's initiative was in keeping with and honoring the law, and thus God. It was not based on romance or eye appeal. Boaz remarks on her loyal love for Naomi, even though she faced poverty as a widow. A woman of excellence is a virtuous woman with a good reputation. And Boaz recognizes Ruth's faith in God too, even during the time of the judges. Her intentions and his were strictly honorable. So we see that Boaz is the same man in the dark as well as in the light. He is a man of integrity. He honors Ruth, and there is no hint of anything inappropriate. Boaz is a man of faith. He trusts God that he had been sent, that he had sent Ruth into his life, and he should accept Ruth's request. Boaz is a man of courage. Trusting God gives him the fortitude to accept responsibility for her without doubt or hesitation. But in verses 12 and 13, we see there's a catch. There is a closer relative who legally has the right of first refusal, who has the first opportunity 
and responsibility to carry out the law. Boaz, however, takes immediate responsibility for Ruth. His command to stay was to keep her safe from prowling eyes and evil intentions during the night. The phrase, as the Lord lives, is a strong statement. It's practically an oath that Boaz will help Ruth. The closer relative will have the first opportunity, but if he refuses, Boaz will marry Ruth. Again, we see Boaz is a man of honor, this time toward the unnamed relative. Everything Boaz does is upfront, honest, and God honoring. In verses 14 and 15, we see that Boaz takes precautions to safeguard reputations. He doesn't want anyone to misconstrue this meeting. And note also that Ruth stayed at his feet all night as he directed, even though she had much to celebrate. She was probably like we were as little kids at Christmas Eve, wondering with excitement, what will tomorrow bring? And then when they wake up, Boaz gives Ruth about 60 pounds of barley. 60 pounds is a heavy load for anyone. Ruth is kind of a pioneer woman, tough and strong. And if anyone saw her carrying such a heavy load early in the morning, they would not think anything improper had been going on. After all, who goes to a romantic liaison with a 60-pound sack? <laughs> Nobody here, I see. Good. So, in verses 16 through 18, Ruth returns to Naomi. Naomi questions Ruth, and Ruth's face probably showed great joy. She tells Naomi everything, honestly, attributing Boaz's generosity to his kindness, what the man had done for her. Ruth had left Naomi with nothing, but she returns with 60 pounds of barley. So we see the theme of emptiness and fullness is repeated. This theme we first saw last week when Naomi left Bethlehem to go to the land of Moab with a husband and two sons, and she returns a childless widow. But the staggering weight of the barley represents the staggering weight of God's merciful grace, what he has done. Naomi realizes that Boaz will do the right thing. He's a godly man whose charity and love towards the widows honors the Lord. Their trust in God led them to this man of integrity who would redeem them. Moving into chapter 4, the first part is all about Boaz and the relative. In the first two verses, we see that Boaz has the courage to act in faith and love. He invites the close relative to a meeting, a public meeting. Official and legal business was traditionally conducted at the city gates back in those days. And there would be elders from the city, like the city council. They would be present at the gate to help on issues like the one Boaz wants to conduct. So this will be a formal legal meeting. And Boaz chooses 10 elders as witnesses, a formidable jury to watch these proceedings. In verses 3 and 4, Boaz states the case. Naomi is selling her husband's family land. The land had probably been unworked since the family went to Moab 10 years ago, so it was overgrown by now. Raw land requires great effort and strength to clean it up so that it could be used for farming. Naomi and Ruth probably could not make the land ready for use, plant crops, and gather a harvest before they starved. So Naomi needs to sell the land for money to live on to supplement their gleaning. One of the duties of the close relative or kinsman redeemer was to redeem land that had been sold by a family member due to poverty. And Naomi and Ruth certainly fit in this category. So the closest relative had the opportunity 
to uphold the law and buy the land to keep it in the family. Boaz states the legal case before the relative and the elders. He offers the relative the land first, and the relative initially agrees to purchase it. Why was buying the land important? The law made this stipulation so the land would stay within the family, even if it had to be sold temporarily due to poverty. Remember, the land was given to each family by God himself. It is a gift from God that should be cared for and remain in the family. So, the land sales were not final because land had ultimately belongs to the Lord. And as he said in Leviticus 25, 23, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are but aliens and sojourners with me. The close relative then agrees to buy the land. But in verses 5 and 6, we see another catch. Whoever redeems the land must marry Ruth. Boaz calls her the Moabite, probably as a hint that the fellow won't want to buy the land. The phrase, to perpetuate the name of the dead, makes it clear that the close relative was needed to buy the land and take Ruth as his wife. The dead here is Malon, Ruth's husband and son of Elimelech and Naomi. By carrying on the name of Malon, by marrying Ruth and producing children, the line of Elimelech would continue. But remember, Ruth had been married before without children. So barrenness is a possibility. And faced with these possibilities, which Boaz must have thought too, Mr. So-and-so backs out. The Hebrew literally means such and such in talking about the close relative. So Now, Boaz undoubtedly knew the relative well, and the author here deliberately omits the man's name probably as poetic justice for the man's failure to uphold his duty toward Ruth's dead husband. Now, why would marrying Ruth cause him to decline his right of redemption? Was it prejudice? Was Ruth's ethnicity a problem? Was it fear? Was he afraid of the potential social backlash of marrying a Gentile woman? Deuteronomy 23, 3 and 4 stipulated uh, that the law prohibited Moabites from entering the assembly of the Lord, the nation of Israel. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Because the Moabites had imposed Israel, God's chosen people, they could not become citizens of Israel. So it's quite possible that the people of Bethlehem would not accept Ruth, casting a bad light on anyone who married her. But but what else could have caused him to decline the right of redemption? Selfishness? If Ruth was barren, both family lines might die. Was it simply a lack of faith in God? We do know it had nothing to do with the land, the work, or money because he was willing to buy the land without Ruth. Boaz had tied Ruth to the land with an argument that satisfied the law and would be honored by the community. Whatever his reason, Mr. So-and-so declines the offer and fails in his duty. While he was in his rights to refuse, it was certainly a departure from custom. Someone unwilling to help the needy, particularly kinfolk, was a coward and untrustworthy. In verses 7 and 8, we see that Boaz can redeem 
In what looks like an odd custom to us, the relative hands over his right to walk on the land with his shoe. (laughs) It's like signing a contract. The handing over of his shoe is duly witnessed, making the agreement legally binding. He renounces his present and any future claim to the land. So we see in verses 9 and 10 that Boaz does redeem. He makes a public statement in front of the elders and witnesses. The elders' presence is important to the legality of the transaction. Kilion and Malon, Elimelech's sons, would have inherited their father's land. And Boaz buys the land from Elimelech's widow, Naomi, keeping the land in the family. Boaz also redeems Ruth. Unlike the land, Ruth is not bought. She did not require a purchase price, nor was Boaz legally obligated to marry her. He willingly chose to redeem her. This powerful public statement is critical to the story. Boaz is acting on faith with courage. Would the elders make a fuss about Ruth's nationality? Would the community honor Boaz's obligation to Ruth? Would Ruth be accepted? He doesn't know the answers to these questions yet. But because he trusted the Lord, Boaz speaks boldly and proclaims that Ruth is now part of his family, even though she is from a pagan land. He confronts everything Mr. So-and-so feared, and he chose to do the right thing despite the danger to himself. He risked everything for God's call to action for helpless Ruth and Naomi. In a sense, he is also challenging the community. His statement is basically saying, this is the way it will be. And this is the courage that faith in God instills. To take a public, bold stand to do what is right. Thankfully, in verses 11 and 12, the people agree. The people and the elders affirm the legal transaction. They also give Ruth a remarkable blessing. That she be like the founding mothers of Israel, Rachel and Leah. Even though she was born a Moabite, Ruth was fully accepted by the Israelites because of her faith, her love, and her loyalty. As we saw earlier, the law demanded the exclusion of the Moabites from the congregation of Israel. But in this beautiful case, we see the spirit of the law being maintained through grace and love. Yet, it is not Ruth's loyal love that's on display here, but God's. Ruth left her homeland to serve her mother-in-law in in the worst of circumstances, forsaking her homeland of Moab and choosing to be an Israelite and worship the God of Israel. God, in his turn, rewarded Ruth. Ruth by extending his grace to her, giving her a godly husband, and accepting her as one of his people. And the people also act in grace, don't they? Accepting Ruth as one of their own. There's another reference to the Pentateuch, Tamar. Genesis 38 is another strange story about the spirit of the law. Without going into details, Tamar survives being an outcast. Even though her actions were sinful, she holds Judah, the fourth son, accountable for his injustice. Judah repented of his misdeeds and proclaimed that Tamar was more faithful than he was. And it is faith in God that saves. Tamar's son, Perez, it will also be an ancestor of David and Jesus. 
And Boaz's own mother was another woman from outside the Hebrew nation, rescued by God for her faith. Her name is Rahab. The courage of faith wins here. Sometimes it only takes one brave, faithful person to impact a community by showing what love really is. The Bible tells us time and time again to fear nothing because we belong to the Lord. Boaz did the right thing with bravery and boldness because he trusted God and so should we. So, the second part of chapter 4, the ending, is the happily ever after. In verses 13 through 15, Boaz marries Ruth. Children are a blessing from God, and he blesses them with a son. As Psalm 139 tells us, God fashions every person in the womb. For thou didst form my inward parts, Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. The son is an heir of Malon and Elimelech, so the family will not die out. Possibly other sons will be the heirs of Boaz. But if Obed is the only child, Boaz is still remembered as being in the genealogy of Jesus. You can see his name in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Brothers and sisters, no matter what the world says, children are a blessing from God. It is His holy choice that gives life. The protector and close relative of Naomi, praised here by the women, is not Boaz, but the child, Obed, her grandson. The women praise God for his provision for Naomi. They offer a blessing for the child, that he would be famous throughout Israel, and that he would comfort and sustain Naomi in her old age, as children rightly should. Sons were considered a great reward, and the women praised Ruth as being better than seven sons. High praise indeed. In verses 16 and 17, we see that Naomi's fullness is complete. According to the women, Obed, which means one who serves, is born to Naomi, meaning that Obed is her redeemer and protector. Ruth, born a Moabite, had become an Israelite by grace through faith, and she was an ancestor of David and Jesus. The inclusion of Ruth in the Messianic line is another example of God's loyal love and his commitment to include Gentiles in the covenant community. Verses 18 and 22 show that the story ends with a genealogy. It is the genealogy of David, beginning with Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. This is not an appendix, but it's an essential demonstration of the purpose of the Lord in building the family line of King David and the Messiah, which the writer would not have predicted, and it includes the foreign woman, Ruth. Boaz's redemption of Ruth points to Jesus coming redemption of all those who believe in him. Love triumphs through integrity, courage, and trusting faith. So these are our lessons in conclusion. Our calls to action. Integrity. Be the same person in the dark as in the light. Two points to consider. First, speak and act in ways that honor God. Whether with people or by yourself. Holiness is our calling. It is our identity. It is not for show. Second, Care for the integrity of others. Be worthy of people's trust. Tell the truth always. Love generously and live out your faith. Second lesson is courage. Publicly doing what is right. 
two points to consider under courage. First, be willing to lose everything to do good in God's eyes. Christ gave all for us, and he is our example. If you accept that everything you have and enjoy really belongs to the Lord and comes from him, then nothing can be taken from you which he cannot restore. Even those we most hold dear, we will see again in the presence of Jesus. Even the risk of life itself, the moment we're before God, we are perfected, holy, and in total harmony with God forever. Knowing this, accepting this, and acting with this conviction frees you from fear of anything evil people can do. Be faithful. The second point is remember that God can work through your courageous stand to have a massive impact on untold numbers of others. Fear nothing seen or unseen. Uphold God's virtues. That honors the Lord we love, and that is our purpose. The third lesson, trust. Love and honor God through your efforts, and he will take care of the results. Two points to consider. First, trust him to act when someone needs a kinsman redeemer, a protector, a champion, a friend. Second, trust him to guide, guard, and deliver you. You're not perfect, and he knows that. So repent when you stumble and fall. Then get back up and try again. How does this story apply to us today, particularly to Christian men? Michelle and I celebrated our anniversary last week, so we watched that great romantic movie, Pale Rider, <laughs> with Clint Eastwood as this mysterious preacher who rides into town and whoops up on the bad guys and saves the helpless folks. And that movie got me to ask myself the question, how far should a godly man go to defend the helpless to do what is right? Recently, we've all seen bad guys hurting women, children, or seniors on video. With able-bodied males, I will not call them men, standing around watching. Violence is bad, even in response, even to stop violence. But as a Christian, I ask myself, how does doing nothing honor God? If I can intervene and stop someone else's suffering at the hands of an evil person and I do nothing, how am I honoring God? God. Have men in our society become self-absorbed cowards that are willing to let people be hurt because I'm afraid to get involved? Let's be honest. It's fear that allows evil to run rampant. Now, hopefully none of us will ever face anything like what has become so common on TV. But the question to Christian men remains, what am I prepared to risk to do what is right, protect the weak, and stand up for the faith? If the answer isn't everything, we might have to look a long while in the mirror. Kurt Cameron said recently, these are exciting times to be a Christian. I thought he was nuts. But then he said that evil is no longer lurking in the shadows, but has come out into the open that we can see it. We know what we are up against because the Bible says things will get a whole lot worse. It's obvious that forces of insanity, cruelty, and evil are trying to tear our country apart by dividing citizens against each other replacing faith in and allegiance to God with human-centered ideology and secular authority. Moral issues have become politicized recently because religion, or faith, 
is the one thing ideology and authority cannot control. Christianity is therefore attacked more than any other because it alone teaches what is truly good from what is truly evil, the true nature of man, sin, and redemption. Today's cultural topics are not political issues, but moral issues. Violations of the oldest and most basic spiritual values Christians should hold as fundamental truths. God creates life. God creates male and female, and he doesn't make mistakes. God commands the pursuit of justice without injustice. And all people are created in God's image, including children, including unborn children, and are not meant to be the slaves of another's sin. No matter what issues confront us, Christians should always be on God's side and act accordingly. Study your Bible to understand God's stance on these things. Don't stand for something God condemns. Brothers and sisters, the world needs Christ and it needs Christians. We must have the love of Ruth, the courage of Boaz, and the trusting faith in God they both had to remain steadfast in times of rampant sin that's becoming increasingly institutionalized in our culture and our laws. All Christians men and women, set the example when they refuse to bow before any idol of godlessness, no matter what it's called or how it is disguised. May God be the strength of our conviction. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful story of Ruth and Boaz. Lord, we pray that you will grow love in our hearts, love for you, love for each other, love for people in general. And in this love, Lord, in these dark and darkening times, grant us courage, grant us the wisdom to know your will, your stance on what is right and wrong, and give us the strength and the courage to say, I will not bow down. We serve you, O Lord. You are our king. Help us to always remember that. To welcome other people into your kingdom with open arms and love and feasting and joy and celebration, but without compromising your truth and your standards. We need you, Lord. Oh, how we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a message of hope. Thank you um, so much, Stuart, for leading us uh, through God's word this morning and just uh, what a blessing. I am so thankful that the Lord saw to come down, to die on the cross, to bear our sins. Um, but God didn't stop there. He raised him from the dead on the third day. And you see, in, in, the, in the book of Acts, Peter says that God shows no partiality, but anyone in every nation can praise the Lord, right? And so for us who have received his name, we praise his holy name. And, and that's what we're called to go out and do. And so as we leave this morning, as we leave praising his name, um, I pray that you've just been encouraged by the word and that we would go, we would glorify God by making disciples of all people as we, um, as we go out as the body of Christ. So if you'd stand together, let's praise his name this morning. Since they are many 
blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead, we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. in our benediction this morning. I have one of my go-to verses as a benediction today. I run to this verse. It's kind of an answer to every question I have. Whether I'm worried, anxious, afraid, confused. And it's a great verse. It's God's words to Joshua. After Moses died, Joshua was chosen by God to lead the people to go into the promised land and conquer the people that were living there. A mighty task, and Joshua had always been Moses' right-hand man. Well, now he's the guy, and he needs encouragement. God tells him in the first part of the book of Joshua, the first nine verses, um, he should have faith. I'm only going to read the ninth verse, which I think applies to all of us in times like these. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God bless you all. You're dismissed.